Hello, everybody. So I have a very special interview today that I've been um, looking forward to doing for quite a few months now, pretty much since I first started This Is Darkness. I've wanted to have a conversation with Nicholas Shrek. So today we have him on the channel to speak with us about his upcoming books and his music and just some general interests that we have in common. So it was his idea that we would release this on the winter solstice. So I think we'll go ahead and get started with him talking a little bit about what's important to him and in general about the winter solstice. Nicholas. Hello there. Good evening and uh, Good evening. Greetings, greetings to your viewers and to you. And uh, before we begin tonight, I did just want to say a word. Uh, your, your program is aptly titled, This is Darkness. And there's no better day to say that on than the winter solstice tonight, because this is the darkest night of the year, the longest night of the year. And as in the ancient Nordic tradition, it was referred to as Mother Night. Um, so what does it mean, the winter solstice? On a spiritual level, I, I want to focus your, you and your, your viewers' minds on the spiritual meaning of this date. So the Winter solstice, the sun stands still, literally, uh, in the northern hemisphere. What does that mean on a spiritual level? Is that this, and, and this has been true going, you know, way back before what is called pagan or heathen times, way back before Christian times. It's, it goes back to, you know, millennia, to the beginning of humanity's awareness of the spirit and the universe that we live in and the combination of how the planets and the sun affect our spiritual being. So this is a night in which we can contemplate darkness and the end of the year and the 365 years will ties in or 365 days ties into something we can we will be talking about later, Abraxas, because 365 is the number of Abraxas, because he is the god of completion. In other words, the god of everything. So as we come to the end of the year, um, I would beseech your viewers to consider this moment of silence and darkness before the next year, 2022, begins as a renewal, because it's, it's actually a very useful time to contemplate non-dualism because this is the longest and darkest night of the year, but also it is the beginning of the light of the sun returning. So this is the end and it's a beginning. And what I would ask of, of you and your watchers is to let go of all of the attachments and hopes and expectations and fears and anxieties and all the emotions that these this past year, which has been a very turbulent year for the world, um, my musical collaborator, Heathen Ray, pointed out that this situation we're in is like a war without bullets. And I can see that with my students and with my friends all around the world. Everybody is cracking under the strain of this very unusual and surreal era that we're in. So. I think the winter solstice is the perfect opportunity, this end in which we look at the darkness and then we, we can look at the light and the sun returning. And I, I want to add, a lot of times when the year ends, people have false hopes that everything will be better. And I can assure you, everything will not be better. We are in the Kali Yuga and all of the prophecies of the ancient Pan-Indian traditions about the Kali Yuga being a time of destruction, dissolution, cruelty, stupidity, ignorance, and plague are all coming true. And that's only going to get worse. So what does that mean on a spiritual level is leave behind your, the attachment to the three poisons of attachment to things and expectation and hope. Leave behind on this winter solstice your hatreds, your fears, your anxieties, your resentments against other people who you may blame for the problems in your life and take responsibility for your life, for yourself. Don't look outwards to attachment. Don't, don't uh, push people away with aversion. 
and consider our own ignorance, consider how little we really know about the universe and about reality and about our consciousness and even about ourselves. And so I would encourage everyone to look at this winter solstice, uh, look at the sun that is returning as your inner light is rising out of the darkness. The outer world is not going to become better. Any false hope, happy new year is ridiculous and even absurd to say that. All the indications are leading towards more divisiveness, civil war, brutality, stupidity, conspiracy theories taking over everybody's mind to the point of lunacy. That's going to continue, and I know it's going to be bloody, and it's going to be ugly. So, therefore, look at the inner light of the sun rising this solstice out of the darkness as your own inner light. And I would say, The best thing to do in 2022 that's coming, and if people are listening to this in the future, it will always be true on a universal level. Look within to the light within you as your guide. Do not look out at the outer world. We have to survive and deal with it, but that is, I think, the best message for the turbulent time to come. So many, many blessings to you and to your watchers on this winter solstice. Excellent. Thank you so much for that. That's a really nice introduction. Um, Yeah. And you mentioned that, you know, I should have, it should have occurred to me as well that the the winter solstice with this is darkness, that really is a a time where this concept of my channel does come together, you know, with the cycle of our planet. So um, I really appreciate you pointing that out to start the stream off. That's quite intuitive. Well, we need darkness to see the light. Um, exactly. it's, a mis- it's a mistake, as, as we'll get into as these subjects arise, to get totally hooked into the darkness without the light. You need both. Again, as I referred to non-dualism, we need to look at both sides of reality. But we can never avoid the darkness, and we can never avoid the light. We need both of them. But to to even see the light, we need the darkness. So that's a point to keep in mind. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I, I agree 100%. And I know that, you know, in, in our current times, in our locations with the pond in between us, um, yeah, there's, you know, there's plenty of things that are happening now and going to be happening in the future that we all need to prepare our own selves for. So, yeah, that really... Um, that really resonates with me, and I think it'll well, resonate we, with our viewers a lot. For, for what's coming in the future, we need to have a warrior spirit. And as I mentioned, the Kali Yuga, I think some of your viewers will know, the Kali Yuga began at the moment of the confrontation between Arjuna and this enemy army when the Lord Krishna came to him and said, you have to fight, you have to be a warrior. This doesn't mean we have to engage in violence. It means in the true sense, and actually like in Sufism, where they, in esoteric Islam, where they make the differentiation between the outer jihad and the inner jihad, we need a warrior spirit to deal with what's coming and where the world is going now. Absolutely. Um, Yeah, I'm really glad that you brought that up in that context. I've recently been doing streams with uh, Craig Williams, uh, specifically discussing the Bhagavad Gita and you know, Arjuna and Krishna and how this warrior Mm -hmm. spirit works. So I think for my frequent viewers, that really will resonate a lot with the discussions I've been having, you know, know, just these, this last 30 days, several discussions on that topic. So yeah, absolutely. Um, Well, in in regards to that, uh, one important thing is all around the world right now, there's a lot of whining and there's a lot of identity politics about I'm a victim And I don't care if right or left, both of them whining, complaining, uh, it's not fair. This is not the warrior spirit to be a victim. You know, the warrior warrior spirit is not uh, complaining and whining. We will deal with what comes up from a position of strength rather than weakness. So I would also say, you know, for, for what is coming in this world, we need that kind of inner resolve and discipline, but not scapegoating and blaming others for your problems or for the problems in the world fix yourself fix your inner life before you you know start blaming others for your problems 
Yeah, and that's something that I appreciate a lot about what you do is that you you know, you're not picking a side in this, you're sort of looking at both sides and saying, hey, everybody in this whole mess is crazy, you know, and absolutely, so, it's, it's, it's never become so I mean, I don't know about never, but in our lifetime, never been quite so much of an open air lunatic asylum to the point where you almost have to just humor people with their psychoses and uh, move on your way to, to yeah, do the well, inner the inner work is what is required, not fixing the outer world is not going to happen. Yeah, well, you know, listening to your previous interviews has, it, when speaking on that topic, has really helped me to put myself into a better position as I move forward. And that was before the pandemic even began. And then especially going into it, um, these things became more and more important and necessary to consider. And, you know, I was on a much more polarized path five years ago than I am now. And I, I try to take what you're saying now a lot more seriously than I would have a couple of years ago. It really, it really is a thing to consider. Well, the, on the true left-hand path, as in, in the traditional, esoteric, legitimate understanding of what that phrase means, which most people don't know because it's been perverted and corrupted by people who didn't know what they were talking about, um, it's very important to not take a side, to be, to be independent and to be non-dualism is, is the essence of the left-hand path. So taking a side, you're already immersed in conceptual thinking, which ipso facto is already wrong. It is already an inaccurate view of reality. And that should be the goal of any spiritual pursuit is understanding what is reality. And therefore, who are we and what is our consciousness actually perceiving? Any kind of taking aside is automatically delusional. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, yeah, th uh, thanks again for for bringing us in with that beautiful introduction. Um, so, I'd like to go ahead and take the conversation into the direction of uh, your upcoming books. Um, you've spent the last few years releasing a couple of albums which we'll get into that in more detail here uh in a little while but mm -hmm. i wanted to start the stream today with uh you know i think the books are going to be we won't we won't talk about dates but you know sometime yeah. in the near future 20, that's well, what we'll 20, be looking at yeah yeah 2022 we can say that assuredly mm -hmm. with all of the delays because of supply chain problems and manufacturing that the pandemic have caused, but we can definitely say 2022 of all these projects. Yeah, so um, if, if if there's anything you'd like to say about the Manson file, you know, what the status of that is right now. Um, right, well, as, whatever, as I, whatever you... Yeah, go, go ahead. ahead, sorry. No, no, well, no, no, you uh, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, just uh, whatever... I don't want you to go into too much detail about the specific content of it, but what can we expect new? I know you've said that that you were you were sort of adding things right up until the last minute here. Um, Absolutely. And now, um, yeah, what happened is because of, it was supposed to be published uh, November 11th, Charlie's birthday of 2020. And then there was a seven month lockdown here in Germany, which. Yeah. And then once the lockdown was over, I had to add a ton of information that was extremely pertinent on all levels about Charlie's music, about new information about the crimes. And, you know, that's finished now. But this is why I have opened a new Instagram page for the Manson file. And I've announced that on my website, which you can look for updates there, uh, nicholasschreck.world. And I also have the Manson File um, Facebook group, which you can join. Because the fact is, the day that it's published and the day that you have it in your hands, uh, there will be more information. It will never end. And I, I could have written a nine-volume encyclopedia of the information I had to leave out. I mean, it is, it's an endless black hole of a subject. But I, I added very pertinent new information that that changes the whole understanding of the case and of the man in the past few months even but you you know feel i'm happy to talk about any aspect of the contents you want to you know you can feel free to ask 
It sounds good. Yeah, I, I'd i like to say, um, I'll go ahead and add links when this is published. I'll add links to these different um, places that people can go that you were just mentioning. But I'd, I'll have to say that the Facebook group is so interesting. I mean, there's just constant daily discussion on there with you and other people that know so much about the topic. I just, it, it's it's honestly at this point the the place that I spend the most time on Facebook just just reading everything that people discuss on there on a daily basis and you're always chiming in with like you just whatever the topic is related to the the Manson file or just the Manson case in general um you've always got really interesting uh content to add to the conversation and it's it's on a daily basis it's entertaining for right me. <laughs> well i mean it, it is a you know it's something that ha supposedly according to the mass media over and finished 52 years ago but it's not and the yeah. reason why the manson file group is so lively and vibrant is because it still touches on matters that are deeply relevant today about the nature of reality about the media what is the true picture of reality that the media presents about uh, things like Jeffrey Epstein and and Weinstein. What? How much does Hollywood cover up? I mean, this is not this is not an old story. That ha it's like, you know, not something that happened in ancient history. It's not really even about the '60s. It's something much deeper than that. And that is why I've pursued so much of my work into this subject is because it touches on things that are deeply important to consciousness, to spirituality, to music to our society, and perhaps most of all, to understanding the forces that tell us what reality is, which is a crucial question, especially in this time, which as I touched on earlier, where people are so gullible and just accepting any nonsensical conspiracy theory that suits their emotions without the slightest regard for what is true anymore. I think it's more than ever an important topic on a much deeper level than just true crime or the sensational nature in which most uh, authors have dealt with it. Yeah, and that's what got me into, that's that's how I got so interested in your content in the first place. I, I read Chaos because I saw, um, I saw the author of Chaos go on Joe Rogan and I listened to them talk to each other for three hours and by the end of it, it went from me being like, oh, Charles Manson is this crazy guy from the 60s that made crappy music and had all these kids on drugs. And by the end of reading that, I was like, wow, there's so much more to it than that. And right. then very quickly after that, I started catching snippets of people commenting, you know, this narrative is kind of crazy. You need to look to what Nicholas Schreck is saying, because that guy makes a lot more sense. And so right. well, slowly I, I, uh, I started getting yeah. in your direction on it. Right. I want to say that, uh, I mean, I've, I have known most of the authors and researchers in this subject since the 80s. Like I first got to know Newell Emmons, who wrote Manson in his own words, who was a former convict, who was a good friend of Charlie's in the 50s and early 60s. So I got to know him and got to know why he believed what he pushed. I knew Bill Nelson, widely regarded as a complete lunatic, but to yeah. my experience, someone who actually did a pretty amazing amount of research and through his obsessive stalkerish madness discovered things that were true. Uh, William Scanlon Murphy came to me from the BBC. We worked together. Um, you know, I set up the interview that he did with Charles, which was very important. So I've, and then Tom O'Neill came to me in 1999. And at first we were moving in the same direction. And I, I respect his, uh, his work as a researcher and, and a lot of what he discovered, but I totally, I think I have to say because of the, uh, Joe Rogan's popularizing and especially concentrating on the CIA angle. I totally reject that. I don't think there's anything to it. And having known Charles for, you know, 33 years, I think it's ridiculous. It's laughable. Now, I do get into what Charlie said about having some sort of involvement in a federal witness program, which is something we discussed, but it has nothing to do with the CIA. And just, I'm not going to get into it in detail, but as far as my research has found, which is based on dealing with people who knew Polanski and Sharon Tate and J.C. Bring very well, and Charlie himself, 
is it's the victims who had connections to the CIA, particularly because a lot of them were Polish exiles. Wojtek Frakowski, his friend Jerzy uh, Kuzinski, Roman Polanski, the artist Witold K. This is all covered in my book, but the the intelligence aspect of that, which so many people are now confused about and, and almost assuming, oh yeah, Helter Skelter was wrong, but Charlie was a CIA guinea pig who an experiment went crazy. That's also totally untrue. It's another false narrative. Yeah. And it's a false narrative that I find unfortunate because it takes away the blame and guilt of Charles Watson and Linda Kasabian, who are ultimately responsible for this totally ordinary drug deal gone wrong crime that happens on every street corner every day and was just sensationalized and covered up by very powerful people to protect their reputation. So this sort of blaming the government, it's its just another, it's another helter skelter like narrative, strangely. It, and it, it still continues this idea of bulioses, even though chaos uh, demolishes Bugliosi, which is great and should have been done, and he did a fine job of doing that, but it still keeps the essential lie that what this case is about is this evil, manipulative, mind control master hypnotizing innocent kids to kill. That isn't what happened. You know? yeah, so well, when, you, when you read my book, you'll, you'll see that. I don't need to... Uh, beat a dead horse about it but yeah that was the thing that blew my mind so much with your narrative on it because yeah you know reading through chaos it's like oh wow he totally destroyed that idea and then you start i start listening to what you say about it and you're like well he destroyed it and then rebuilt it right in its place basically with you know knock down the old blocks build up new ones you still got the same castle basically Right. Um, well, yeah, the, 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 he hasn't thrown the baby out with the bathwater, the baby being yet not not only did Charlie hypnotized with his bizarre evil powers, which is just laughable, yeah. ridiculous. Uh, it, it was the evil CIA who somehow taught him how to do this. Tex Watson, Linda Kasabian were just scumbag, sordid drug dealers who had a long history of ripping people off drug burns and criminality and connections to the underworld this they didn't need the cia to hypnotize them and they didn't need charlie to hypnotize them they yeah. did what they did on their own volition so yeah but yeah. when you read my book which will which will be in your hands soon you know i think i make a fairly compelling case i will add there will always be mysteries about it mm -hmm. nobody on earth it can claim to know exactly what happened and i certainly and don't the further either. we get away the harder it'll ever be to to do that so it's that's Absolutely. pretty much just the thing that's lost to time at this point we can only within, within within the past weeks i have tried to interview very elderly people who died I yeah. like i get i get connections every day obscure peak criminals and uh faded movie stars and people who know this little bit of information or that and i get you know, data from people all the time saying you need to talk to so-and-so. And just in the past weeks, people have died who had valuable information. So, yeah. yeah. But anyway, you will you will soon read the Manson file, and then I won't have to talk about it anymore. Finally. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I highly recommend, uh, you know, getting a pre-order or getting it when it goes on sale to everybody watching, because after having listened to hours of your interviews um, and I have, I feel like I have a pretty good idea of the direction you're going to take, but still I can't wait to get my hands on it and read it. I've read the first edition, but that was so small in comparison oh, yeah. to what, right. you know, the second edition is just almost impossible to get a hold of right now. So I have not read no, that and the, one. And the, and the, the prices that, the really prices good. that collectors sell it for are obscene. And somehow people assume uh, that's my fault or that I'm making some profit of that. Of course, I'm not. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, so we are we are we are make thing. we are making it available from now on at a fairly affordable price, you know, for for perpetuity, because I don't really encourage that kind of insane collectors prices. And I do want this information to be available to everybody. So yeah. you can order you can order that now and you can find it online by looking for the Manson file. Myth yeah, and reality and I'll put a link in there shaman. so people can find it, you know, right below okay. here when, when it's up on YouTube, right. they can go right to it. Right, um, right. And when, when it when when you have it, I'd be happy to come back to discuss it in more detail from from that point of view.
Yeah, that sounds good. Uh, okay. And then, so moving on, I guess, to the Satanic Screen, that's another book that you, uh, your first edition of it came out some years back. Mm -hmm. And that's also, you know, pulling incredibly high prices on the market right now. Again, I'm sure it has right. nothing to do with you. Uh, you would, nope. if you could, ha you know, if you could have a stack of them sitting there to sell them yourself, that would be great right. for you. Some I have, other random I have, person on eBay selling yeah. it for $2,000 does nothing for you. <laughs> right. I have my, I have my one copy left of from what, what the publisher gave me. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, yeah the, the satanic screen was published in 2002 by creation books in London. And then uh, a new version of it, a totally updated version, was released in 2018 uh, in German-speaking uh, audience uh, as Lucifer's Leinwand, which means Lucifer's screen. So basically a rough translation of the satanic screen. And that it was greatly updated. And now a new English, French, and in other languages will be released this year, um, updating from where I left off in 2020 or in 2002 to today. And specifically getting into something we discussed before the show, the introduction, because I found it to be so necessary because there's so much misunderstanding about this topic, yeah. about what is, what is Satan? Who is Lucifer? What is the devil? Because there's so many wrong assumptions based on folklore and uh, mostly pop cultural misconceptions that I correct it in detail. And, um, you know, and, and uh, you touched on this. There, there are many people, because of my involvement in the, as a target of the satanic panic in the 80s, uh, I have not been a Satanist in any way, shape, or form since, you know, the 1990s. Um, but, you know, and, uh, first impressions are what strike people. And if people don't look into it, they don't realize that there's probably nobody on earth who has renounced it with the ferocity and viciousness with which I have as totally, <laughs> totally worthless, a dead end of no spiritual value and also completely misunderstood. And I've touched on this in some interviews, but I, I think the, the important point is the devil, Satan, Lucifer, is not what Satanists or Christians believe it to be. And of course, I have to address, it is a truly existent being. In no way do I think now or have I ever thought that it's just a symbol or, or a uh, myth, myth or a legend. It is an actual being. And if you're going to have the arrogance to say you represent that being, you better damn well know who and what it is. Um, and many people don't because they think it's just a game to play. But I can tell you from personal experience, it's not a game and it will have very malevolent results if you work with that power, with that energy, without knowing what it is. And it is not, you know, I don't know how much you want to get into that. It is not what people, it's not what Christians think it is. It's not what Satanists think it is for the most part. And, uh, you know, it has, like any spiritual being, you cannot use the symbolism and name of any being. I don't care if it's Athena or Odin or Lucifer without knowing exactly what are you conjuring, what are you bringing into your life. So that's a very serious warning I want to add. So if people assume somehow that I still have any sympathy for it, having seen the depths of the entire satanic world, all of it, having known most of the people who are supposedly the leading uh, lights and quotes of the satanic world and being totally disappointed and disenchanted by them, you know, I absolutely don't recommend it as anything to get involved with at all. Yeah, yeah, well, and, you know, thank you, because as I said, uh, you you say you've had to say this over and over again, and and yet here I am today saying yet once again, can you uh, can you talk on this topic real quick? Yeah. Because oh, it's, I it's, know it's, you know it just keeps coming up in conversations like, oh, that's the Satanist guy, and it's like, right. no, not for a long time. He's he's had right. to say it no, over I'm, and over and over again, yeah. and you know, <laughs> I guess it's well, just that's one of those that's things. that's that's the nature of being a public figure. It actually it it doesn't bother me. Because yeah. I've just learned that. I mean, that's how it is. It's it's like 
I'm I'm still in Radio Werewolf. The Radio Werewolf mm-hmm. ended in 1993. I'm still a Satanist, although I haven't been, and I identified myself as a devil worshiper anyway, not as a Satanist. I haven't been that since the 90s, you know. But uh, I, I call that the Ziggy Stardust syndrome. Whatever the first thing people saw you do is what you will remain forever. And it's just the way it is. No matter how much you change, no matter what you do. I mean, I have been, I formally converted to Tantric Buddhism in the early 2000s. Before that, I was deeply involved in what you could call the Hindu left-hand path and the, the Shakti way of Kali, you know, so... You know, and I ha- I think in a way, though, it is an advantage that I was a devil worshiper, that I have looked into occultism and practiced ceremonial magic in a serious way, because I can speak upon it authoritatively in a way that most people involved in traditional religions cannot. So, I mean, I, my critique of it is from within rather than ignorantly from without. Yeah, and and I'm glad you do look at it this way, because to me, you know, it's better to have to correct somebody's previous understanding of you than for somebody to just be like, I don't know who that is. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's better to have uh, something that needs to be fixed and people, and, and you do know so much about that topic. And, you know, I, we won't need, we don't need to get into too much detail about it, but right. your knowledge of the topic is sort of what led you out of the topic in the well, first I know, place. Because I, I, you were like, I know too much of this to really even play this game with you guys. That's very well said. That's exactly right. I mean, I, I, when I want to know about something, I obsessively research it to a maniacal degree like I have with that. that why do my, my books result from people asking questions and my frustration at, okay, it's too long. You don't have uh, three days for me to explain this to you. So let me put the information down. And so, yeah, I know everything there is to know about the devil, so to speak. And that's why I rejected it because I looked so deeply into it. I saw it as not what you think it is at all. And, and probably the people, the reason people think I rejected it is not what people would think. Yeah. And well, and there's some stages to that, too, where, you know, some people are already going to know this, others aren't. But, you know, first it was that you rejected Anton LaVey because he wasn't taking it seriously and you were. But then you rejected the entire concept after that. Right. 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 So absolutely. Well, Anton, I mean, Anton LaVey briefly, I mean, I've said this before, but I should point it out. I never was a follower of him. I never was particularly an admirer of his. Yeah. Uh, I was writing a book called The Demonic Revolution in 1988 during the Satanic Panic, which I was dragged into totally yeah. unwillingly uh, to clarify what it is. So I interviewed everybody, people from the OTO, people from Asatru, people from traditional witchcraft, Richard Ramirez, you know, you name it. I spoke to everyone who was alive at that moment who was had anything to do with occultism of that kind, and so LeVay was one of them, and I in, I got to know him because I interviewed him. We became friends on a secular level because of our mutual interest in music and film and military history and strippers. Uh, it had really very little to do with any mutual agreement on religion or Satanism. I never did agree with him particularly on that, and he didn't care that I didn't. And so, yeah, when I found out the degree of his fraud and his lies, I couldn't have anything to do with it. But, you know, I never was this great admirer of his. And I was a great and remain a great admirer of Zena. She yeah. was a powerful and remains a powerful magician. She, she is why I remained involved in that milieu. And of course, she rejected it when she was 24 years old, you know, because she knew it all too well. She knew what a lie it was. She knew what a phony the whole thing was so she rejected it and she moved on long ago so she still struggles with this that that people still think she has any connection to that at all which of course she's a very devout practitioner of tantric buddhism and a teacher of it and a yogini for many decades now so yeah yeah well and you know i i say that whenever the topic comes up around me and a lot of times i bring the topic up because as i said i've since i started my channel i've been interested in talking to you so 
you know, whenever something on the periphery of what you discuss comes up in my topics, I sort of bring you to the attention of the conversation. And, and I, and that's when I do find people have so many misunderstandings about you and Zena right. and Anton and, right. you know, Satanism as the, as the concept that Anton had put together. And right. so, you know, I just, I do a lot of sort of correcting people through my own right. stream. So right. I well, just to, nice uh, to, yeah, to sum ahead. that topic up, uh, the introduction of the satanic screen has a very detailed explanation of what I, my understanding of what the devil is and therefore why then to even begin to think about his manifestation in the cinema, you have to know what is he anyway. So without getting into a theological, um, expose here that you, you will find that in the satanic screen and German readers can find it already in Lucifer's line bond, which is currently available. Perfect. Yeah. I'm definitely looking forward to the English version of that. Uh, so, okay, well then let's go ahead and move on to, uh, the third book that I wanted to discuss with you today, the Abraxas book, which has been very recently, um, announced it was sort of a soft announcement. Um, I found out, you know, I follow you and Cyclic Lull on Instagram, and I, I remember seeing you posted a post about how it was going to get its French version on Cyclic Law, and then right. um, and then Frederick reposted that. So then I knew, like, yeah, this is definitely happening. So um, oh, yeah, well, actually, an interesting anecdote which illustrates how magic works and the power of this god Abraxas, um, in you know, in the, before the pandemic stopped everything, I was going to give a performance at the Wave Gothic Treffen, which is the largest Gothic festival in the world. I was going to be doing a performance in May of 2020. And usually when I go there, it's in Leipzig, I give a lecture the day after on some topic or other. I've done that before. And um, I was going to give a lecture at the Museum of German History in Leipzig about Abraxas, about uh, particularly about how Abraxas is strangely connected to the city of Leipzig, because a lot of famous German authors who really began doing research into that god were in the city of Leipzig. And it's a very strange subcurrent of that topic that German literature has focused on Abraxas a great deal. Carl Jung, Hermann Hesse, and many, many others. It, it's like a main topic of German literature. Uh, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe is probably the first German author to really mention it in a, in a poem from long ago. So, it's, so I was going to give a lecture only about that aspect of how weirdly it is that for some reason German literary figures have seized on this obscure Gnostic deity, Abraxas, and other countries have sort of ignored it. It's, it's one of the odd metaphysical mysteries of this god, which I address in the book. So because of the pandemic, the concert and that lecture were canceled. And strangely, this was the third time I was going to give the same lecture. The first time I was going to, uh, with John Murphy and I, where we had written music based on Abraxas that we were going to perform at a place called Atelier Abraxas, uh, run by my friend Leticia Mantis in Leipzig. And her place, in some weird Lovecraftian way, just literally started crumbling from within and fell apart. Oh, wow. And she, and, and she eventually had to close it. So John and I were going to do this performance um, based on Abraxas with music, and I was going to give this lecture. So that ended in this strange way as if it was fated not to be. Then there was another opportunity to do it again in Leipzig and that was canceled. And then finally the pandemic and I said, all right, this is not meant to be. I will just put this and the decades of information I've gathered on Abraxas into a definitive volume. So there was some force stopping that happening. And and this is the interesting part magically. To, and I think it illustrates the power of Abraxas. And I have the evidence of this. It's not one of these things that's just folklore. I announced in July of 2020, all right, this lecture I was going to give in May is canceled. Therefore, I will make a book of all my research on Abraxas to 
you know, to deal with it definitively and finally and authoritatively. And I announced it, and um, and then the publisher contacted me immediately and said, oh, well, we would be interested in publishing it. And, um, and I said, okay, I, I have all these other things to do, my albums, the Manson file, etc. When I get to it, I will contact you. So then I had time to, after I have released these, albums that I had been concentrated on recording and releasing, I then turned to other literary projects. And there are many more than the ones we're talking about, but the Abraxas book was one of them. And I started that. And then on August 1st, I contacted the publisher and said, okay, no, I literally had my phone in my hand and I was about to write to him answering his query of July, 2020, where he said, okay, I'd be interested in it. And I wrote to him and said, all right, I'll let you know. I was just about to write, okay, now I'm ready to do it. At that moment, in from the USA, before I could push the button to start writing, he wrote to me at that second saying, what's happening with the Abraxas book? Wow. <laughs> so, I mean, and I, actually I was, I thought, wait, did I already write to him? It was actually confusing and baffling. <laughs> and that's, that's the so cool. that's the way that magic works. Yeah, and, absolutely. And so um, within 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 a few hours, we had an agreement of when it would come out, what the conditions would be. So, so there's some sort of strange force of it not wanting to happen three times being canceled, and and I take three seriously. There's a kind of symbolic, numerological when you when you knock three times at something and it, it doesn't answer, and then this and then with the book it almost was meant to be with this strange synchronicity and also because of Carl Jung's connection to Abraxas it's interesting that this Jungian synchronicity of me writing to someone at the second they're writing to me after over a year the likelihood of that timing is obviously ridiculous yeah that's so interesting things like that don't happen very often but when they do you really have to say what yeah. what just happened there and why did that happen um right so just to clarify a little bit there so for the u.s edition which will be the english version i i'm assuming that uh, right. that's going to be through uh ajna offensive which they're they're publishing arm ajna bound correct and that and, and that was who that was who wrote to me that's who with whom this magical synchronicity occurred perfect. so he he was involved with it so he can testify it really happened that way yeah, and yeah. he has a really nice uh, distro of of a bunch of different book companies. So I'll drop a link to to Ajna Bound in the in the in the right. comments uh, in the right. description and after we're done here, and people should definitely check that out. We are, we also we have discussed some other projects that will be happening too, but I don't want to overwhelm Perfect. your viewers with too much. But yeah, there will be other other collaboration between us. Yeah, well, I'm and, I'm and really then, happy then, to hear that. And then, as you said, the French edition will come out. And for some reason, my books have a resonance in France. And uh, for instance, the first edition of the new, huge, updated Manson file from 2011 was commissioned from a French company, uh, Camion Noir. And that I, I frankly didn't even want to do it. It was so overwhelming. I thought, I don't want to deal with the bullshit and hatred and nonsense and and getting back into this incredibly toxic world of the so-called manson community which is a bunch of hateful lunatics fighting with each other and i knew okay by doing this that's but i didn't even want to do it but this french company asked me to do it and so i agreed to do it and the odd thing is my connection to that whole phenomena began in paris where roman mm -hmm. polanski was born and I had this experience in 1969, in August of 69 in Paris, that drew me into the whole thing. So there is some bizarre, and then, so again, a Braxis book will be published in France, The Satanic Scream, we're preparing a French version of that. So there's some karmic connection to, uh, to La Belle France, who knows what yeah. it is. Yeah, uh, so are you talking about when you saw, um, 
the fearless vampire killers is, is that what correct. you're referring to there yeah. okay yeah correct okay. We, we won't we won't go into that whole thing but just so i'm i was well i, I can i can i well now now that you've opened that can of worms <laughs> i can because people will say what the hell is what's he talking about so yeah. i just briefly address it and actually again like the synchronicity with abraxas something very strange happened recently with that just to make it very brief and you can find i've written about this in the manson file facebook page and elsewhere and in other interviews but to sum it up briefly uh, i was a great enthusiast of horror films and anything to do with any occult or dark theme as a child which is probably no shock to anyone yeah. and um and there was a movie theater in paris that was exclusively dedicated to horror films and that was like paradise on earth to me and it had this very gaudy um, painting a mural of vampires and satanists outside something you'd never see in america it was very erotic and you know uh, witchy in the midst of the 60s occult revival which i was very much caught up in so i saw the film la balle de vampire as it was called in french with english subtitles and um it affected me in a very strange way. It gave me a feeling of dread, which I describe in the book, because that's what dragged me into it. I didn't know this, but that was right before the murders happened. It was literally the weekend the murders happened. And I believe I had a strong premonition of something awful. When I, it's, a, it's a humorous film. It's a black comedy. It's not Yeah, it's a really terif- fun film. Yeah, it's a, it's a great film, but it's not terrifying in any way. And yet I no. felt a deep dread, uh, uh, an emotional reaction to it that I couldn't understand. And then uh, that was my first trip to Europe. So I saw that and I didn't know what the hell is this feeling. I didn't know. And when we went to London right after that, the day that Polanski left London to go back to America, when he, he was right there when we arrived there. So... Somehow I was right there in the midst of all that. And I didn't. Now, the interesting thing is, why is that a synchronicity? How I found out about what these murders were really about, the the little, the first little chink in the door that opened to this abyss was the star of that film, Ferdinand Main, a German English actor who plays uh, Count von Krolock, the vampire in the film. Uh, Zena and I befriended him in the 90s, and I was going to work with him on a film I was making at that time. And we took him to the Magic Castle, which is right on Franklin Avenue, right where, right in between where Bernard Crow, the drug dealer Lots of Papa, was shot by Charlie Manson after Tex Watson ripped him off in 1969. And on the other side is an apartment that Charlie lived in in the late 50s and early 60s, where he operated his pimping operation, Three Star Enterprises. We took Ferdinand Main to dinner and to a magic show at the Magic Castle, which is a private club for stage magicians. And during dinner, he said casually, you know, I mentioned where we were, because of course he knew Sharon Tate. He was good friends with her. He liked her very much. So I mentioned the odd coincidence of where we were. And he said casually while we were eating, you know, none of that is true, what they said in the papers, you know. And then he told us, not not in any kind of like secretive way, just like, you know, everyone in Hollywood knows that's it's not true, you know. And and he didn't even know the details, even though he loved Sharon Tate. He really loved her, cared about her, was a good friend of hers. He didn't even know the name of Tex Watson, but he he just knew, you know, yeah, we all knew that was a drug deal, that they let these people in the house. And he just treated it like, oh, that's just common knowledge. And, the, and then and he said, but you know, I can tell you who will tell you everything. Uh, one of my best friends, and this was Gene Gutowski, one of Roman Polanski's friends, happened to be in town that day. He never hardly was visiting his son. So because of Ferdinand Main's recommendation, so in other words, the star of that movie that in 1969 gave me this feeling of dread is who opened the door to what really happened. And then he introduced me to the producer of that movie, Gene Gutowski, who then, for some reason, talked quite openly and honestly about what really happened and, and was of incredible help 
to my research at a time when I wasn't even really looking into it. It, it came back to me. And then the final thing, which to gets into magic and how this works with synchronicity, like the Abraxas one I mentioned, when I was finishing this last version of the Manson file last summer, before it was supposed to be published in November, I checked into a hotel in Berlin and in that room that I went into, I checked into a hotel to work on the chapter about Dance of the Vampires specifically. I walk in and there's a picture on the wall of the production, the musical of Dance of the Vampires in that room that I'm given. And it turned out that at the hotel next door, at a theater, Roman Polanski produced the musical version of it in 1999. So I walk in there to write about that topic, and there it is again, this thing that keeps returning in my life. So that's the metaphysical aspect of this bizarre phenomenon. Yeah, that's crazy. There's there's so many connections there, you know, related to the case and then related to your connections to the case. Um, and so to stay on the Manson topic and on the Abraxas topic and on the music topic, um, right. I, I've, I've really been enjoying this Abraxas cassette that I have here from Charles Manson that was recorded in uh, Vacaville in the early 80s. If I'm if I understand correctly, right. I'm pretty sure. Right. Yeah. So, um, the, you know, he was Manson was the first time I had heard about Abraxas talking, you know, just in interviews that I've watched of his where, you know, he, he mentions Abraxas numerous times throughout mm -hmm. his various interviews over the years right so right. you know this came out well after all of that like well later i mean he probably again it was recorded in the 80s so this had already happened at the time that he recorded all these interviews but to us it never i don't think i don't think there's really any versions of this that it came out before so i guess i wanted to ask um if you have any kind of insight on this recording or you know if there's anything that you'd like to say specifically well, about the abraxas album because i love it so much personally. yeah well that that whole period when i mean people assume because that's what they're interested in that i contacted charlie because i never thought he was the maniacal cult leader. I never was particularly interested in the crimes. I sort yeah. of accidentally, because I knew him, and then by chance, not by desire, ended up meeting people directly involved with it in, in Los Angeles in the process of my own music and, and film activity, discovered what happened. Um, I contact my interest in him was about Abraxas and his music and his radical ecology and his mystical ideas. I really didn't give a damn about the crimes particularly and, and had not even really looked into them much at the time I met him. Um, the thing about the Abraxas album and this whole period in Vacaville, he had access to at least a fairly decent recording uh, mechanism in Vacaville. And that was the only time he ever did Mm -hmm. Vaca Vacaville had a weird connection to the California Arts Council, which at that time were kind of like, it was like a hippie or counterculture idea that prisoners, at least in Vacaville, which was a mental facility and a hospital. So it, it was not the kind of high security hell realm that he had been in, in Folsom Prison or San Quentin or Corcoran. Vacaville is a was a little more lax and they encourage the prisoners to do artistic pursuits so the thing that when you listen to the abraxas album and other some of his the best music he recorded during his pri his final prison stint was all in vacaville and there's two reasons for that is that this california arts council gave tape recorders and video recorders to the prison to encourage prisoners to express themselves Maybe there's two other reasons. Charlie, at that time in Vacaville, he basically told me he faked extreme mental illness to get out of Folsom Prison because he was mm. being harassed. Kind of like if you know One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, it's a lot like that. What happened to him? It's a horrible story, actually. Yeah. He, he was being harassed by other prisoners in Folsom Prison and extorted and a lot of brutality and 
because of his reputation, because people believed he did order the killing of a pregnant woman, which is against, is a taboo in the code of the underworld, because black prisoners did believe he wanted to start a race war, which he didn't. So he was in a very difficult position, false in prison. So he deliberately didn't bathe, he didn't respond, he, he put on an act to get, he knew he would be sent out of Folsom. And then he regretted it, but for a very brief period in Vacaville, he had, he could play his guitar on the lawn. You know, I've talked to other prisoners who knew him there that sat around. He gave impromptu concerts like he did at the Spawn Ranch at Vacaville, and he was free to do that. Ever after that, he never could do that again. Um, they encouraged, and, and he actually was trying to go along with the parole program at that point, which he never did again. He actually did think he had some slight chance in hell of ever getting out if he cooperated. He never cooperated with the so-called program again. Yeah, um, that illusion faded away. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then what happened, so he recorded his best music of the prison period, in my opinion, during this Vacaville period. And one of the first things when we got in touch with each other he sent me out on this wild goose chase looking for some of these tapes, which were he had sent all around. And, and, and that's how I met a lot of people who knew him, a lot of people involved in the commune who were not very well known, who gave me, uh, as a digression, a lot of information that hadn't been known before. But it was my search for that music that was like the first involvement we had. And so the Abraxas tape that's called Abraxas was recorded during this very fertile creative period when he had the freedom to write music he was allowed to have the guitar he performed for other other prisoners he gave like little concerts for them the prison staff encouraged him to do so but then he was heavily drugged because vacaville is a medical facility and against his will he was given these extremely potent but very destructive um, pharmaceuticals and he believe that it damaged his brain permanently. He, I could he, see that. He said that he never was the same again after he that. Didn't, yeah, he didn't seem the same after that in interviews, for sure. Right. I mean, he, he had lucidity and he did he had periods of, uh, of clarity, but he, he was the first to admit that whatever they did to him in Vacaville fucked up his mind royally. And so that I think that's why that was a very first... That was the last time he was totally uh in control of everything and had the freedom to record so that's the background of that abraxas tape which i like very much too and that's the you know he did do some interesting things under the terrible conditions he had in san quentin and corcoran a, a bit more but they mm -hmm. were recorded on terrible recording techniques you know he did he didn't have access to anything and and, and they hardly even let him have a guitar they were constantly taking it away from him and his own self-destructive violence to the guards and, and defiance. You know, he, unlike Bobby Beausoleil, who cooperated and was able to record music, he never, after Vacaville, he just said, fuck it, and never, ever cooperated with the prison authorities again. So that's why that recording, you know, is a more controlled and, and he had time to compose these things a bit more. Yeah, well, the... As far as interviews and music goes, the 70s seemed like they were basically a black hole for him. There's there's hardly any of either to be found. But then these these cassettes, these tapes, you know, from the early 80s, they right. really sort of show that connection to the Manson of the late 60s that everybody right. sort of knew and recognized. And then by the time you talked to him in the late 80s, he just seemed like he had changed in certain ways. As you say, he was still a very intelligent person and had a lot mm -hmm. of interesting things to say and was coherent. Right. But he just something in some of that that free spirit that he had just seemed like it had died throughout the mid 80s between right. these tapes well, well, and even, when even, you met him. I can, I can say too that in the San Quentin period was like paradise compared to the Corcoran period thereafter. He yeah. was, you know, he, he was much more in control and much happier in a better mood, uh, had more clarity. When he went to Corcoran, the conditions there were barbaric, the guards, the corruption, the other prisoners, you know, it was, people think he didn't, you know, he lived this cushy life and did, he did time. He did yeah. hard time. 
Mm. And a lot of it in solitary. Yeah, a lot of it in solitary, which will drive anybody which changes nuts. you, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, when I would talk to him when he came out of solitary, he was took a long time for him to get back to Earth. He would, yeah. but, but solitary, no matter how strong your mind is, it's going to fuck up your mind. So, yeah, he did, you know, he if pe people that hate him think, you know, he got away with murder. Well, whatever you think he's guilty of, he, he did very hard time, very mm -hmm. brutal, you know. And uh, if he was supposed to be this great uh, government agent in the field, he sure didn't get any special reward for his service to Uncle Sam. So Yeah, seriously. Mm -hmm. Um so uh thank you very much for for illuminating that that part of the story for me because you know the these this music from that period and the late 60s i i pretty much love all of the songs from the late mm -hmm. 60s and from the early 80s whereas then you know everything after that just sort of i like some songs here and there i don't like other ones some of them right. are just sort of whatever um mm -hmm. but so there's the Lost Vacaville tapes, which is a, a, a an al a vinyl that's released by uh, Manson Underworld right. Production. Um, right. So I know that's like the Lost Vacaville tapes, like it's literally called that. But was Abraxas also part of that? Suppose you know that collection. There were of tapes there were there were there, there were several tapes that he wanted me to find from people, and I went all over California looking for them. Um, that lost Vacaville tape was the first one he sent me on this wild goose chase to look for. Yeah, yeah there's, there's some songs on that on that vinyl that are just fantastic. I mean, it right. just the music moves me. Like that's what I was saying to you um, when we were having our pre-conversation, where um, s some of the girls said, you know, Manson's voice stays with me, and what I you were like, no, he's not, there's I don't agree with the mind wash thing, but my point that I said was, you know, I don't think they heard him telling them to do things. I heard, I think they heard his songs because I will get a, I will get one of his songs stuck in my head and it will stay there for two weeks. Right. Not well, because he, of some like, you know, no, no. whatever, but just because it's right. so damn good. The lyrics resonate with me and his tone of voice. I just love mm -hmm. the music. Right. Right. Well, that was, I mean, when I first contacted him about putting out that, I wanted to put out the album that um, Henry Rollins was going to put out, but he canceled it because of death threats and public reaction. And I wrote to Charlie and said, well, I'll do it. I have nothing to lose. And he agreed right away. But he said to me, you know, the tr my music causes problems and trouble. That's what this is all about. So if you take mm -hmm. this on, you better understand it's going to create trouble. And if it has. It always will. I mean, and that I'm not going to get into it here, but in the book, what happened has a lot to do with his music. Yeah. None of that would have happened without the appeal that his music had to these girls, to Terry Melcher, to Dennis Wilson, to Frank Zappa, to Jim Morrison, to Neil Young. That's why this happened, one way or the other. Yeah. But that's well, all. That's all in the book. I don't want to really get into all the baroque details of all that right now yeah sure and i i'm very much looking forward to reading about that stuff um but yeah just to finish up on what you were saying there uh henry rollins and then the guns and roses they they both took a lot of heat for their connection for you know right even even considering that they liked his music you know the press right. just tore well, the funny them. the funny the funny thing uh, henry rollins you know i um yeah, I said to Charlie, well, I'll take this on. And he agreed, but it didn't happen because uh, we he wanted to put out these other tapes, which I couldn't find. Uh, yeah. The Guns N' Roses thing briefly is funny because Radio Werewolf, in the, early, in the early part of our career, we shared a recording studio that we all paid for with Guns N' Roses, really? um, the Red Hot Chili Peppers, and a few other bands of that era. So when they'd be breaking down, we would come in and put up our instruments. And so we knew them and I, you know, I've seen them now and again since, um, they were very aware of our Manson connection, you know, back then they didn't know anything about it, but I've often mm. wondered if that, you know, we so talked that might've been it. the crumb that, that led, uh, I'm, Axel Rose down that street yeah, that made no, him want to put, uh, look at your game or, you know. Yeah. That's, that's not <laughs> something I'm proud of whatsoever. Um, I, I like Sl Slash was a decent person. I got along with him. Axel Rose was a mess even then. 
I can um, imagine. Just a, dr a drug drunken idiot. But Slash was a fairly decent human being. But I wonder about that because that was at the midst of our Manson connection and the band concerts and the notoriety that Radio Werewolf had because of all that. So just as a, a digression. Yeah, so um, let's now move into the direction of your music. So I wanted you to speak a little bit on, you know, what happened to you, I believe it was in 1984, that got this whole ball rolling with the music of the spheres and your trip to Egypt. Um, mm -hmm. However much detail you'd like to go in on that part, but I find that sure. to be a really interesting topic uh, of yours. Right. Well, I had, I mean, since 1981, I had already been pursuing music and had and was involved with other, like I began as a keyboard player, not as the lead singer in a band called The Creeping Unknown, which was kind of like a beatnik, um, hard to describe, but sort of neo-beatnik operation that I played organ in. And then the Radio Werewolf, the genesis of that began as early as 1981 when I met a keyboard player, an organist, who had exactly the same vision of what I wanted to do. But we sort of drifted apart and uh, I went to Egypt in 1983, in the fall of 1983. And to, I've described this elsewhere, so I'll just be brief about it. Mm -hmm. I had essentially a vision and an oral, A-U-R-A-L, not O-R-A-L, um, manifestation of a communication that I believed and still believe came from my visitation to the tomb of the Pharaoh Seti I, who was a Setian Pharaoh, a ruler who was dedicated to the god Set. And I was looking into the origin of Set at that time because I was already deeply involved in ceremonial magic and in England connected to some of these pseudo Crowley and Telemite uh, organizations that were working with SET and I found that what they were doing was not very accurate. So as I said, when I become interested in a subject, I become obsessive about it. So I went to Egypt to look deeply into all that and I had, to, to sum it up, I wanted to leave America, the Reagan years of America, the, the rise of the moral majority and Christian fundamentalism. I, I knew that was going to be an ugly, dangerous thing, and I didn't want any part of it. And I wanted to move to Egypt, which is crazy. I was young and stupid. Egypt was a dictatorship. I could not, and, and you know, only Mubarak had only recently taken over after the assassination of Anwar Sadat. But I thought I'll move out in the desert and build a temple, and I will retreat from the world and concentrate on meditation and magic and become liberated or enlightened. I, I'm, it, that's how long ago I gave up on the world and on the hope of society. And I haven't changed my mind. It's just that this experience in Egypt, basically what I felt that Set communicated to me was you are being a coward. You cannot escape. You have to fight this evil and ugliness that is in America. You have to go back to it and fight it. And, and from that, and a sound that I heard, which I've described elsewhere, a particular sound communicated this to me. It's hard, it's hard to describe how, but it was a mystical experience in which the sound told me what I needed to do, that I know I cannot retreat to Egypt and meditate and do magic out in the desert. I have to go out and, as I said at the beginning of this, be a warrior, fight it. And Radio Werewolf was the vehicle for that. So when I got back in the, again, the year 1984, which had all this sense of dread and Orwellian um, prophecy to it, that's when the Radio Werewolf ritual began. And I contacted this organist and it all very quickly came together as if it was meant to be. So that, you know, in a, in a nutshell, that sums up what yeah. happened. But, but this whole idea of sonic magic, of of using music as a magical operation and a consciousness changing, um, that it's not just an artistic activity, but that it actually changes consciousness. I already was theoretically interested in that, but this experience in the tomb of Seti the First, um, and actually I've written a song about that experience, which is on the Kingdom of Heaven album 23, 
which was released in 2015, uh, called Midnight in Cairo. If you listen to that song, I don't really tend to write autobiographical songs, but that one is a direct uh, musical narrative of what happened to me in Egypt. Interesting. I will have to check that song out in that context. I don't think I knew that 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 song was connected to that. Um, mm -hmm. so. Well, I don't. I don't hit people over the head with these yeah. things. I, I, <laughs> I like. I like my listeners to be able to interpret what I'm doing however they want without you know telling them it means this or it does that. But that particular song, you know, it does enhance it to know that I'm describing things that it's exactly what happened. Yeah. That's that's such an interesting start to your musical career. And, you know, it's it just seems like everything that you've done since then has all stemmed off of this. And I know you've talked about this in in uh, previous interviews where sort of you've said everything that you do is part of, you know, it's all a ritual. It's all part of an overarching. Right. Um, it's it's all it's part work. of the right. whole. Well, like when I write a book, it's a spell. It has an intention. It has a purpose. Every word in it every period the way that the paragraphs are designed when i write a song it has a purpose to change my consciousness to change the consciousness of the listener it's intentional i mean there's a lot of spontaneous inspiration in the true sense of the word that goes into it but it is within the context of magic and ritual yeah well you know i think you were in a, in a lot of ways really ahead of your time with that sort of ahead of everything else that's happened over the years in that in that context because you know we've got so many uh occult book publishers now that weren't wasn't necessarily the case back then that and with the specifically the ritual dark ambient genre of music where you know a lot of people are focusing directly on that sort of way of of making music now whereas mm -hmm. you know back then some there might have been the occasional thing to happen like that but there certainly wasn't a genre and it wasn't right. well something you know that you know i can i had right and just just the other day actually i met um someone who i gave this essay i wrote for the magazine beat them because I was very influenced in the 80s. I wasn't part of the 80s. I was looking at the 1930s, the 1950s, and I was very influenced at that time by William S. Burroughs and his pursuit of magic. And he, you know, he dealt with set and Egyptian magic and that kind of thing. But I wrote an essay for Beatdom about his use of magic, which quotes uh, something I read in an interview he did in 1975, I think, with Crawdaddy Magazine. He, William Burroughs was speaking to Jimmy Page, and I'm not any great fan of Page or Led Zeppelin or all the Crowleyan nonsense that they pushed. But in it, Burroughs made this quote, which I quoted in this Beatdom essay about his magic, in which he said, all artistic activity is magical, basically. And that, you know, as a teenager, that like really turned something on in my mind. So, you know, everybody is part of some lineage. I may have been a pioneer in ritual music and, and, and using music for occult or spiritual or metaphysical purposes, but I was also inspired by Burroughs and to a certain degree, Kenneth Anger using film as a mm. magical vehicle. I just thought, well, I can use music in the same way that Anger uses film or Burroughs uses writing. Uh, that's very interesting. Yeah, I was I was wondering if um, that was a question I was thinking about asking you about Kenneth Anger, about what you thought of his films, because, of course, you know, Bobby Boussoulet did the the Lucifer Rising soundtrack. So, right. again, there's sort of a connection there to the greater topics we're discussing today. Yeah, well, he, he is seen as godfather. So I've met him many times and got to know him. Bobby um, is no, no, Kenneth. Kenneth oh, Kenneth Anger. Anger. Okay, yeah, Kenneth okay. Anger. Yeah, Kenneth Anger. So, you know, and she grew up as a little girl with Susan Atkins in her kitchen and Kenneth Anger being in love with this kid he met, and he called Cupid or Lucifer. So, you know, that's like everyday life for me. That's, yeah. she, she grew up with that, you know, before the murders happened, she knew the name Susan Atkins as this flaky girl who her father hired to be a stripper or she saw Kenneth being in love with Beausoleil, you know, so when the murders happened, they knew who these people were. 
Very interesting. Yeah. So that's whatever, why... whatever, whatever karmic connection brought me into that. It's like, it's been, it's been a tapestry in my life endlessly. Yeah. That's so interesting. Um, and, but, uh, you but know... I, I, as far as answering your question, uh, Anger's films inspired me as a teenager. I look at them now and I'm not particularly impressed with them on a craftsmanship level. And I mean, I've written about his work in the satanic screen. I think he has made some amazing films, but I, I think overall I've come to the conclusion he was in the right place at the right time. And he never really did anything after that very brief flower. I mean, without the 60s, there was nothing for him. It was the perfect time for him to capture what he was trying to capture. But I, I have to look at an artist's whole body of work. He never did anything again on that level. So I think he happened to be there at that moment and connected to these currents going on and he captured it. But I don't know that he's a great filmmaker per se. He he just he 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 captured a moment that is like a time capsule and it certainly influenced me in my youth, but looking at it from a more sober perspective, you know, he definitely influenced things like MTV and the use of ironically using pop music to illustrate uh, filmic narratives, but yeah, I've sort of changed my perspective in, in maturity. I mean, he's important as an yeah. influence, but I don't know that he's a great artist. Yeah. I think, I, I think I have a pretty similar feeling on the matter too. There's, you know, there's things I like, but yeah, as a whole, it just seems like he could have done more than he did. Um, right. you know, I kept yeah. looking for that like magnum opus and it's like, well, <laughs> right. you know, it never really came to be. Um, well, he, but has actually... a very, he has a very difficult personality. I mean, he's, he was a very troubled, uh, manic person who, you know, struggled with drugs and, and extreme temper problems and constantly fighting with people. And like one amusing thing, the last time I saw him was at the birthday party of Forrest J. Ackerman, the editor of Famous Monsters of Filmland, who we were a mutual friend. And he actually said at this birthday party, he said, you know, I've never held a grudge in my life. And Kenneth said that. And then he described putting a curse on someone and how happy he was when their car crashed and they died. <laughs> so <laughs> Jeez. so, so yeah. that kind of sums up how I see Kenneth. Yeah, well, so I was the, the the context I was going to ask you about Kenneth Anger and was in relation to uh, you mentioned in your podcast interview, which I would recommend for people to go check that out. You did that recently on podcast, a great channel discussing Manson topics in much deeper detail than I ever have or will. Uh -huh. um, you guys well, can, actually, uh, actually, actually, I didn't discuss the Manson topics too much deliberately. I'm waiting no, to yeah. realize the book, but I we discussed my music. So, yeah, yeah, and you had mentioned there that uh, you really liked soundtrack music in your youth. So I had wrote a couple of my, a couple that I liked from back then was uh, the Loose for Rising, um, various things by Goblin and Dario Argento's films. Um, right, Gob Christoph, Goblin. Christoph Kamida in general. I really like what he did in Polanski's films. So I was wondering if yeah. any of those guys resonate with you. Totally, 100%. Beausoleil's soundtrack to Lucifer Rising. I heard, I, actually... Strangely, in Westwood, which is where UCLA is, mm -hmm. um, I, Lucifer Rising, I think it premiered at UCLA. I saw it in 1980 when he finally finished it. And what impressed me was Beausoleil's soundtrack. Yeah, it's an amazing soundtrack. Yeah. And he did I mean, all more, that in prison, which is all the yeah. more amazing about it. Right, yeah. Anger paid for building a, a crude recording studio in Tracy Prison, where, where he and Clem Grogan actually was also on that. He plays guitar. Really? Yeah. I did not know that. They were part of the same band, prison band. So yeah, so Beausoleil's, I mean, it's really the only thing by him I think is really great, Beausoleil, but it's a masterpiece. The other stuff can take it or leave it. It's okay, competent, but that is really inspired. Uh, Comida, absolutely, and, and this Dance of the Vampires experience in 1969, I already knew his music from Rosemary's Baby the year before, which of mm -hmm. course had a big impact on me being a child devil worshiper already. But Kamita's, I mean, all of it, I've listened to all of even his more obscure jazz albums. They're all great. He did a soundtrack for Cul-de-Sac. Yeah, I love I, I, the Cul-de-Sac soundtrack. 
Yeah, it's and, great. And Knife I, in the I, Water also. Really yeah, all good of it. Stuff. K- K- Kamita is a huge influence on my music, absolutely. Nice. Um, and um, who was the third one you mentioned? Because it was also relevant. Oh, oh uh, Goblin. Goblin with no, Dari Goblin. Argento. Actually, actually <laughs> Goblin too. Uh, strangely, around the time I, I went to UCLA a lot to see the film programs there, they showed a lot of European and avant-garde art house films. And there was a record store in Westwood that had the Italian version of Goblin when Suspiria first came out. Nobody cared about it, knew about it. It made no impact in the United States at that time, but I loved it. And I found the. I remember finding the Italian import of the Suspiria soundtrack by Goblin and listening to it, you know, thousands of times. So that had a big influence. Other soundtrack composers that had a, a lot of importance to me were Nino Rota, who did all the Fellini scores, wrote The Godfather, oh, yeah. um, but especially the scores he wrote for Fellini, particularly Casanova, that had a huge influence me on that time. A lot of European film soundtracks, um, Maurice Jarre, there, you know, there's an infinite number of, uh, and James Bernard, absolutely, who wrote the soundtracks for most of the main Hammer horror films that had a huge, this very dissonant, uh, bombastic sound that James Bernard put in all of his soundtracks definitely is a huge part of my musical DNA. And, and prob- much more than any rock musician, soundtrack mu- I see soundtrack music as the continuation of 19th century romantic classical music and avant-garde music. And, like, and I, would, I know you want to segue into the ambient thing mm-hmm. but i have to say I, the the ambient music i've done is more influenced by modernist 20th century classical music like Ligeti, um mm-hmm. pendereski not yeah. i'm not I, I mean i like brian eno's albums when they came out his first uh particularly on land that had yeah. a huge influence on me me and a a girlfriend of mine, we lived in this haunted apartment and listened to that album On Land by Eno on acid many times and nice. like brought us to some <laughs> other brought us to some other dimension. So that is an album that had a big impact on me. But I'm not really like a great admirer. I think a lot of ambient music is more interesting conceptually than an execution. Mm-hmm. But so the influence on that part of the instrumental music I've done, which I will be doing more, is mostly comes from Ligeti, Pendereski, Morton Feldman, like these 20th century modernist classical composers. Excellent. Yeah, that's that's great. I that's one of the things I was wondering was what um you know what led you to want to work on something like uh The Lightning and the Sun, because it, that's a really amazing album and it's so it's it's a lot different than you know a lot of what you were doing with radio werewolf you know you right you touched well, I mean, on a lot I, of genres with radio werewolf right but, well i mean uh, i i think i think if there's anything that is a cohesive red thread in my music is i don't have any genre yeah. even though i'm i you know just i will always be lumped into death rock and gothic which i never use those words but you know you, it, that's show business you get stuck with a label and uh that's fine, but it's, I never felt connected to that. So lightning in the sun. I mean, there, there's other, I guess you could call it ambient (laughs) instrumental music, which I have recorded and I, which I will release. And what I did with my first band skull culture, which was in 1981, which we only released some audio cassettes, uh, that you could consider to be ambient though. I didn't use the word at that time, but the lightning in the sun was, when the first phase of Radio Werewolf from 1984 to 1988 ended, when Xena and I collaborated for the first time at this 888 ritual in San Francisco, and then the drummer of Radio Werewolf left because he was offended by the political implications of that concert, and Xena and I immediately began to collaborate on songs for the end of the world Um, But the first thing we actually released together that we worked together totally in collaboration was the lightning in the sun. So that was like a totally new era in Radio Werewolf, which returned to my prior interest in 
these 20th century modernist composers like Ligeti, Penderecki, Messiaen, etc. And as with all my music, I've said this before, I don't, I don't have a genre, I don't have a style. The subject matter of the song, the theme of the song dictates what it should be. And that was influenced, as I think most of your uh, viewers will know, by Savitri Devi's book, The Lightning and the Sun. And it was an, an attempt to create a sonic version of what emotions that struck in us. And actually, one of my favorite Radio Werewolf songs is, the, is one that Xena composed for that uh, Sleepwalker. Um, that's, that's, I think, one of my favorite Radio Werewolf songs. And in some ways, that, out, that, that EP is the purest expression of Radio Werewolf in some ways, in my mind, personally, as the creator. Um, yeah, well, it definitely resonates with me the most as, you know, as somebody that I love dark ambient music, you know, that's that's my bread and butter. So, you know, that right. album really sits nicely with me. <laughs> right. And it was done under ritual circumstances. And so, you know, it was, you know, a very powerful magician. And, and so it has the energy of our first coming together and working together as musicians and magicians. So I think it has a lot of uh, resonance because of all the emotions that went into making that. And it was made during a very turbulent time in 1989 when the satanic panic was at full blast. We were very much fighting, you know, our life was very much a war at that point. Yeah. So that, that, that energy very much informs it. We also had a certain amount of hope. We had just been in, uh, or, or communism was falling apart in Germany and elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And we had maybe, that was like the last moment I had any idealism left that the world could improve and that with the defeat of the Soviet Union, that would mean American influence in Europe would recede and the Soviet would recede and that Europe would return again as, as the center of culture and world power. And of course that didn't happen um, and that's sort of when I gave up on any idea of even meta politics. That's when I realized there's no, there's no hope. But that there is a feeling of idealism in that music. Of a feel, I think we felt at that moment there would be a better future possible. Even though it was a very, in many ways, a dark time, we did see the. I mean, one of the ritual purposes of Radio Werewolf was the defeat of the Soviet Union and of communism. That would, and and that's why they're really we we discontinued it shortly after the fall of the Soviet Union because we, we did a ritual in East Germany in in uh, you know during the DDR period nine days before the wall fell so that you know there there were real world consequences to the magic we were doing we had goals and when they were achieved when you achieve some of these goals then you end the ritual you don't just keep going. People would like me to keep doing Radio Werewolf reunions the rest of my life, but yeah. you can't go you can't go backwards. It was not just a band. It was a ritual that had a purpose. That purpose ended. And now we're in a totally other time. That that is not the proper vehicle to deal with the conditions we have today. Yeah. Well, you know, you were saying back in the eighties, you know, you were going on these different shows and you and Zena were sort of the face of of confronting this panic the satanic panic and it was a panic yeah. um and you know now you know you're speaking in in recent songs you know several years back you well it hasn't been that long ago you were speaking about current events but i i wonder you know when the bottom fell out of the satanic panic how did that feel for you and xena because people probably had been looking at you like these people are crazy. These people are evil. This they're they're trying to they're trying to defend something that's undefendable. And you mm. know now you know thirty years later we look back and say that was insanity. Well, we knew it then, and I have to say, Zena did the lion share, and she is a lion connected to Sekhmet and the lioness goddess. She began that fight long before I did. I mean, she recognized the danger in a way that her father in his cowardice did not want to. He hid he hid in his black house and hoped it would go away. She yeah, saw he basically just set up a piñata for all the lunatics to go out and start whacking. 
Right, right. And she went out on the front line. She knew this was going to affect people's lives. She knew innocent people were being destroyed by this moral panic, and she took it upon herself to fight that. And she, she began doing that long before I became involved with her. And so I give her total credit. She was the, and, and, and as his daughter, she was the right person to go out there and fight this. And um, on, on my own personal level, you know, uh, in 1988, I was on Current Affair saying Vincent Bugliosi is a liar. That yeah. trial was a show, <laughs> that chi- trial was a show trial. A lot of people came up to me on the street and said, we always thought so. I agree with you. That's great. But I was considered, and I'm still considered a total, how could I dare defend Charles Manson and say that the great Vincent Bugliosi is lying? Yeah. Um, Steve Dunleavy, this horrible tabloid journalist, like attacked me on the show and I'm used to it, you know, and now I think even the mainstream people are starting to understand 30 years later. Yes, I was right. Bugliosi was lying. He coached the witnesses. What was said in court is not true. And, but it takes a nice liberal secular humanist to say that stuff for it to be acceptable. I'm too evil. (laughs) <laughs> to, yeah. to say that so yeah, well, you know was... so as, as far as satanism you know I, I i was not a great admirer of the church of satan but my point was you are lying this is bullshit this is not true and the conspiracy thinking as you ask what did we think when the satanic panic receded of course you know it's it's a pyrrhic victory it was ugly we yeah. saw america is not a free country America does not allow religious freedom, and we abandon America, and yeah. with no regret. America is not a democracy. Uh, you know, the religious right, you know, okay, we, we defeated them, and especially Zena coming out very aggressively over and over again, defeated that particular phase of it. But here we are in 2020 with nonsense like QAnon, it's the same thing. It's yep. worse. It's worse. It's crazier. It and it has reached. At that time, it was only evangelical, you know, the born again movement. And and in L.A., I, I'm not going to get into this, but like elements of the police department were deliberately harassing me and trying to frame me for crimes during that period. Born again Christian anti satanic uh, elements that were in the California government were, you know, trying to persecute people, and they did, and it was real. It was a real civil rights issue. People's rights were being destroyed, and would, and nobody cared because these are supposedly evil people, and that's what America does. It picks an evil enemy to, to uh, make the scapegoat for everything. But so was that, that was a temporary victory because here we are, QAnon is considered you know, you've got legitimate politicians spouting absolute nonsense. And it's yeah, based yeah. on the same idea that an elite satanic cabal is controlling the world and, and nonsense that goes back, you know, to the to the paladin conspiracy theories in Paris in the eighteen hundreds. So, you know, the we we did we succeed, we fought that battle, we won that battle. The war of against stupidity cannot be won. And it's not going to be one because we see that today. Uh, and on both sides of the political spectrum, people are driven by a motive conspiracy theories that are not grounded in any kind of fact, only on fear and creating, you know, basically they don't know the difference between propaganda and history. Yes. And, <laughs> yeah. So, so I have a very dark That's... view of the future. Uh, I've seen it before. I fought that battle. Maybe we won that battle, but the war will continue forever. And yeah. people, people's, people's basis of knowledge is worse. People, I mean, the 80s were like an intellectual pinnacle compared to where we are now. The level of stupidity and ignorance and lack of awareness of history and facts is, is uh, you know, that's a dark age. As Radio Werewolf predicted, Radio Werewolf was saying, this is the end of the world. Then this is it pay attention and it did end and we are in a posthumous state now yeah well you know as a student of history on a university level that's 
I was sort of trained to tease these things out, you know, before all of the current craziness happened, where it's like, you have to look at the actual history of what's happening in the world and say, how is this being shaped to fit a narrative? Who's right. writing the narrative? Who's telling the narrative? What reason do they have for saying it the way that they're saying it? Mm -hmm. And, you know, again, that's why all of these different topics I'm discussing with you today, I really respect you as a human being because you are able to tease all of these inconsistencies out wherever, you know, wherever the discussion lies, whether it's in Manson or Satanism or whatever we're talking about, these things are, you know, well, I think what things you are way more said, complicated. Yeah, what you said, I think, is ultimately my central theme. Even in a lot of my music, what, what the question is, who is dictating what reality is? What is reality? Which narrative is true? And why are you being told that this is true? And a problem we have today because of the internet is that people think, all right, I reject main, so-called mainstream media, but I will believe some idiot who happens to have a blog who has no valid information because at least they're not the mainstream media. Well, that's also not exactly. a solution. Yeah. That's the problem. <laughs> there, there are real facts. We can determine what really happened to a certain degree and just a motive spouting of you know people saying do your research that's not research looking on google <laughs> to see what what an idiot who knows the same amount of information you do and is feeding it back in a feedback loop that's not real research so that's the we have a you know a crisis of information at this point and it's all the more important to to ground things in historical reality absolutely um so I, the next thing I'd like to ask you about is uh, what it was like to work with John Murphy, um, how the way that you did work with him and what it was like to work with him. I know he's mm -hmm. a very important figure to our the community that I yeah. frequent. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. Well, John Murphy was, you know, one of my best friends and we had an immediate musical rapport. We had the same musical taste. We were both very influenced in our adolescence around the same time by by listening to kraut rock records when really nobody was even thinking about them him in australia me in california and uh you know we were inspired and influenced by a lot of the same music so we came together on that level the original idea was we were going to form a band um i mean it would have been my solo project that i'm still continuing and when I returned to music after a long hiatus, a deliberate period of hiatus in which I concentrated on my spiritual development and wrote several books and moved to Europe, um, when I decided to return to the concert stage in 2014, it was with John doing this ritual performance that was dedicated to the eternal feminine. And we did a concert in which I did cover versions of all of the female singers that inspired me to become a singer in the first place. Nico, who John had worked with, for instance. Yeah. So that was that. Now we were from that, we were going to form a band and we, we already were working on songs and then he got very ill and we couldn't do it. So the time with him was that we actually were able to work together was brief but very precious. And yeah, he was a very close friend. We had the same kind of dark sense of humor, the same view of the world, the same taste in music. And we, we just bonded immediately. Uh, and he was a great loss. Um, you know, there's really no replacement for him. And, yeah. uh, and I, the only thing I would say about that is the tragedy, I think, what is to learn of it in his youth he was, you know, deeply involved in the whole rock and roll lifestyle of drugs and drinking, and that's what killed him. And I was there when he died. And, you know, it's it's unfortunate that he died so young, but he's, you know, for the most part, he had changed that lifestyle, not entirely, not enough. But, yeah. you know, I want to tell people who get up in the romance of the rock and roll lifestyle and of, of being a junkie, of being a drunk, of, of taking drugs, that this is where it leads, is an ugly, painful death. And I witnessed it. And, you know, he was a great musician and a great person. And it's a pity that he was lost. But he was lost because he got caught up in that rock and roll lifestyle of drug abuse. So 
I think if there's a lesson to his life, you know, stay away from that shit, get away from it, uh, get it out of your life. Yeah, yeah. Very well said. I, I agree with you. Um, so uh, another interesting thing that, that was brought up in your uh, podcast interview that I wanted to have you go into a little bit more detail on this topic, you mentioned um, you mentioned that you were looking to use uh, Anton and Artad's uh, Theater of Cruelty mm -hmm. as uh, your way of working with music. And um, there's some other music art projects that I, that I know of that, that also uh, work with that, that will be very, um, Martin Blod in particular is the person I'm talking about that I know of that I've interviewed before. That's very central to his work as well. So I was wondering if you could speak a little yeah, on I've that actually, I've actually performed at a festival with him in Berlin in 2016 and met him. So yeah, yeah he's, he's a great guy. Yeah, I'm familiar with his work. Um, yeah, Antonin Artaud's Theater of Cruelty. I mean, I came, as I've said before, out of a theater background. And, a mu and I'm probably, uh, I was very, like I've said before, I had this very elitist, snobby attitude about rock music and pop music. And I like classical music. And, and uh, I probably would have gone into some area like that mm -hmm. of theater or opera. That's, and, but I thought Antonin Artaud was the, taking the ideas of the theater of cruelty and bringing them into music is absolutely what I did. With Radio Werewolf, it, it was it, that was my strategy and scenario, and I re I read all of Arto, all of it, uh, as a teenager, and was very influenced by it. And one of my, I guess you could say, kind of a musical mentor, if I had one, was Tomata Duplenty, the lead singer of the Screamers, who I knew in the late seventies. And there was a library right across from the Mask, which was the only like punk rock club in Hollywood at that time. And this Ivar is right across from a strip club that we used to go to. And there was a um, there was a copy of a book called Our Toe and After. And we both stole that book from the library and shared it. And and he was already influenced by Our Toe. He came from the hippie generation. You know, he was several yeah. years older than me. So he was already doing that. And in a way, what the screamers were doing, he and at least he was deliberately using this same confronting the audience with the theater of cruelty techniques of Artaud, not not trying to be an entertainer or make people comfortable, but confronting them, really yeah. address trying to wake the audience up rather than soothe them. And so that, you know, that definitely inspires me to this day. Yeah. And, you know, that's something that that I see in Martin's work, uh, when his, in his solo work and through his project IRM, and then through what you were doing with Radio Werewolf, where, um, people that don't know how to take art for art's sake, get really, really offended by the performances, you know, and, uh, it's sort of on purpose in a way. And it's, a, uh, it's, a, uh, it's interesting. Well, these, these days, uh, I mean, the way that I perform, I look into the audience's eyes. I'm right there. I'm, I'm communicating to them. And it frightens some people because especially these days, you have a lot of performers who are up there with a laptop, hiding behind the laptop, not really engaging with the audience. And I, you know, I bring my whole being to communicating each song to the audience and it, it does intimidate some people more than ever now you know yeah, it did yeah. it did when i started but people people psychology was very different yeah and um I, another thing i wanted to follow up on with your instant with your recent conversation with paul was you were um you were saying the next time that you go back on stage you want to try some you know some new things but you also sort of said that you don't really want to think too much about what that's going to be but i thought you know maybe it's been a maybe you'd thought further about that and if you had anything else to say on it it could be well no i i have i have thought about it and um when i'm the the pandemic had the pandemic not happened i would have gone on this very traditional tour to promote my 2019 album, The Illusionist, in 2020, starting in 
in May of 2020. I would have done a lot of concerts in the traditional way. And the pandemic, if there was a blessing or, or a silver lining to the cloud, it made me think, I mean, I never liked the way the music industry presents music. I don't really like the most concert venues. I don't like I don't like the whole casual attitude of rock concerts where people just hang around and it begins at some point, usually late, and then people are drinking and looking to eat. And it's more like a social event than an artistic or ritual ceremony. And so whatever I do in the future, I, I will do it in a much more controlled fashion, not in that kind of casual milieu, which I never, ever felt comfortable in, but the pandemic just made me think, why do I want to return to the way things used to be done? So it will, it will be more like it, it will begin at a certain time. It will be a ritual that will start and end, and there'll be no casual hanging around, and it will have a sense of purpose and dignity and a sense of occasion. Like when you go to the opera or you go to a dance recital, you know, when the, when it's, when the curtain opens and the lights come on, everyone is silent and you take in the experience. And, and so that is more the tendency that I want to go into. But we'll see what happens. You have to be flexible. I yeah. know that it won't, it won't always work in an ideal, perfect way. But, you know, as far as the theater of cruelty, too, like performing in places that are appropriate for the music. Exactly. Not, not in the same crappy club or... or venue because it just becomes all very anonymous that way it, it loses yeah. its it loses its its uh gravitas and purpose so so a much more intentional kind of performance uh just as a little personal addition to that i i totally agree and um in 2011 i saw jethro tall play on a on an ancient uh roman theater stage in Ostia Antica, just outside of Rome on the on the shore. Mm -hmm. And it was a magical experience. We sat in the ancient Roman um, amphitheater stone seating and watched him right. up on that ancient stage. It was just and there were no opening bands. There was it exactly. was just we walked for a mile through darkness in the ancient Roman ruins, sat down, Jethro Tall played, and then we walked mm -hmm. back out of there. And right. it was That's just it was yeah, that's incredible. A, that's exactly what I intend to do in the future. Even though it will be more difficult, people will find it harder to grasp. It won't be as convenient. Mm -hmm. But after these this weird two-year period of having to reflect, okay, when I get back to performing, what is the proper way to present my work? I can't go back to the usual same old, same old. So that's the kind of thing I have in mind, for sure. So yeah, I know that exactly sounds great. Yeah, I mean, op opening acts only if it's somebody who's working in the same vein, mm -hmm. which there are some, but I'm also thinking very much of, like, rather than having only music, having dance, film, art, like, a, like uh, not to be too pretentious about it, but like the Wagnerian, Wagner is a huge influence on me, the idea of the Gesamt Kunstwerk, the total artwork, and I just think you know, the rock and even alternative rock and ambient and industrial world is very much dealing with stereotypes and cliches, the way that it's done. You know, like I, I got the concerts I went to in 2019 when friends invited me, they were just exactly like concerts I went to in the punk rock era. Yeah, nothing, nothing changes it's with, actually, across the genres, across decades. Right, it's all right. exactly so the I thought same. This is all very conservative. It's not radical. It's not waking people up it's very sleepy and comforting and you know it's it's just routine it, it and that's what i want to do is wake people up get them to to be alive not comfortable and so i think yeah exactly what you said the the roman amphitheater and there's many kinds of of appropriate places not only ancient but modern yeah. so yeah, yeah absolutely that will, that will be the direction i go into and um you know, your your album Berlin Noir is probably my favorite of your releases across the entirety of your career. I really love that album. Thank and you. I think uh, I think a lot of what we're talking about right now, I think that's what I like about that album, because that feels like you've sort of 
manage to encapsulate that feeling into the album it starts out with the with the narrative the girl saying you know welcome to berlin noir and and the whole thing it's just like an experience from beginning to end i think right. it was no, really I... well done and and i Thank think you. you know people should definitely check that album out in its entirety yeah that is available on Bandcamp. uh like everything in the pandemic we were going to put out a vinyl edition and we are going to still do that but as you probably know and probably a lot of your musician watchers know uh manufacturing vinyl became delayed again by many months so we yeah. will put out we will put out a definitive vinyl version but i'm yeah i'm very proud of it and and the musicians that contributed did an excellent job on that and yeah i'm and that's why i said recently those three albums are of a piece they form a trilogy and wherever I go in the next movement that I make, it, it will be based on that, but it will be going into another direction. But yeah, I, I also feel that in Berlin Noir, kind of like with Lightning in the Sun, encapsulated the purity of the Radio Werewolf project, whatever phase I'm in now, I think Berlin Noir summed it up. Yeah, excellent, yeah. Um, and so, okay, so I have two more questions here for you. Um, I, I'd like for you to talk a little bit about Heathen Ray because um, he seems like he's, if I'm correct, he seems like he's becoming a pretty permanent part of your project if there were oh, one absolutely. aside from yourself. And yeah, so absolutely. maybe you could just no. speak his yeah. praise for a moment. <laughs> yeah, no, I have, I have nothing but praise for Heathen Ray as a musician and a human being and a friend and a, and a comrade. And, uh, you know, dealing with this very difficult period of the pandemic we have a very similar sense of humor and approach to the world so our working together on i mean during we had this very strange isolated period of of working very intensively on the albums berlin noir the ep shrek 2020 afraid of america and oh a weird flower the album that was released in march of this year and so we had an opportunity to really perfect what we wanted to do musically and uh yeah he is absolutely an integral part of my music and will continue to be and i i can't praise him enough as what he what he brings as a drummer is he's not just keeping the beat he brings a lot of emotional intensity and texture and power and also i should point out he studied shamanic drumming in kazakhstan and oh, so his perfect his approach to music is very spiritual. There's nothing he does that is unintentional. And also his, his uh, what I require in musicians that I work with is a great deal of versatility because I, you never know what style will be required. And he's yeah. able to, I don't, I don't even have to say to him, this song needs this. He knows what needs to be. And that's very important in the studio and live. But above all, our, our absurdist sense of humor about the world is it made it very easy to work with him. So yeah, he's a great musician. Perfect. Um, and okay, so then to close this out for the day, I think this would be a fitting ending. Um, again, something that you mentioned in, Paul, in Paul's interview, which was great, and I recommend people to go check that out because he they really go into detail about uh, the current your current discography and mm -hmm. people uh, people will be able to get a much clearer sense of your most recent albums if they follow this up with that so i do recommend that and i'll actually put a link to it in this so people can check that one out uh, but you you said um i'm paraphrasing here people listen to too much music we should leave silence mm -hmm. oh i absolutely believe that i mean that's it's like when you're making a painting you need you need negative space you need you need to leave space for you to imagine what you're going to fill that space with and i think uh music has become like tap water you know you just can't be because of the omnipresence of the smartphone and people entertaining themselves to death i mean people can literally you know you, you look around any major metropolis nobody is paying attention to where they are they're all you know, got earbuds in and entertainment has just become a, a, an addiction, a drug. And that is not something that can change your consciousness for the better. That's, that's a crutch to avoid reality. And that's not what art should be. 
I mean, I could say the same thing of literature. If you love literature, you shouldn't read 24 hours a day. You, if you are a gourmet appreciator of food, you don't gorge yourself with McDonald's all day long or whatever's there. You have to clear the palate. So if you're truly, I mean, some people use music as background noise to get away from their inner chaos and neuroses. But if you truly love and appreciate the spiritual power and the transformative effect that music can have, you need to do it in moderation. And like when I listen to music, I don't just put it on as a background. And part of the mental illness, which I have called it, of being a musician, is you're just totally captivated by sound. So, you know, I, I can't ignore, like if I hear a song I hate or a song I love, I have to hear it. I, I can't escape it. That's a kind of weird uh, neurotic sensibility of something to do with the nervous system of musicians. So yeah, I heartily recommend that anyone would have, it's like a mental hygiene. Don't overdo it with listening to music, even music you like. Allow it to, you know, to be something precious. Let there be silence and then bring the music into it. Don't, don't just have a constant wall of random sound. It's like people that leave the television or the radio on in former days just to not be lonely. So I think that's a very dangerous thing to do with art. You have to, you have to appreciate it, not take it for granted. Yeah, I, I never thought about that. And, you know, when you said it, I was like, it just like hit me like a ton of bricks, like, obviously, you know, be, so many of my favorite albums, I play them out and they lose their magic. And, you know, right. I should have, I should have not gorged myself on that release and it would still hold that magic for me. But I just, you know, I just obsessively absorbed it until there was nothing left to get out of it right. and now right. now i put it on and it's just bland and it's like exactly this should be magical and i i've killed the magic so well it, it has yeah, to do really with the way resonated. it has to do with the way human neurology and dopamine works it's like a drug if you keep taking the drug you're addicted to you need more and more and more of it to get the high and it's this muse music has the same kind of effect so in moderation like taking a psychedelic. If you took it every day, mm -hmm. it loses its power. Music has the ability to have that kind of change of consciousness, but you need to use it wisely. It's, it's a power. Like the Sufis, you know, who use music and dance for spiritual purposes, they don't do it all the time. They are very, they preach that it's very important to do it at the right time. So, and I think, I think for musicians especially, that's important for those of you out there listening who are creators of music, you don't want to have all these influences bleeding in. You need silence to allow the music to rise within you rather than be informed by a, a constant bombardment of noise. Absolutely. And so, as with all good things, this too must come to an end. <laughs> right. And then we can, we can stop babbling and have silence, which is necessary now. We've, yes. we've, we've, made, we've made enough noise. Now there can be quiet. Yeah. So thank you so much, Nicholas, for speaking with me today. This has been just as, as wonderful of an interview as I was hoping it would be. So I really appreciate your time and opening up on all these topics with me today. We were sort of everywhere, but I think it had a coherence to it. So I really appreciate that. And uh, hopefully I'll get to speak with you again sometime in the future Absolutely after some of these books will. release. Yeah, thank you very much for inviting me. And I enjoyed the conversation too. And uh, again, uh, winter, winter solstice blessings to you and to your watchers and for those in the future. So, Omani Pemahomi.